Hello and welcome to the Common Sense Gospel. I'm Danny Simmons. And I'm Kurt Norbert. And we're looking at part two of Little Sins. The The title of this episode is Little Sins, part two. And just as a, a reminder, we had received a request from Jake. He is in McAllen, Texas, and he was wanting to know more, just asking us to kind of delve into this idea of the, the idea that we have become Christians, we're faithful, we're walking in the Lord, and we we have had great victory over some of those big issues that we knew were wrong and we've dealt with those appropriately. But as we continue to grow and develop in the Lord and read the Word of God, that we're starting to see that there could be more I can or should be doing to to be to remain and to remain sanctified, to to, to be to be pleasing to the Lord. And that really is an ongoing process. And so in part one, I tried to address that. But but today, as I promised, we brought in the heavy hitter, and he's going to straighten all this out for us. We Kurt, don't have room in here for a third guy, Danny. Oh, I'll have to tell him to go home. Yeah. So it's just me and Kurt then. But, but as a reminder from the first show, we have Ephesians 5.13, which tells us all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. And I, I began to draw that out and, and show that this light that God provides, it, it shows and reveals everything ultimately. And so as I've seen some of those big things and dealt with them, that light continues to shine. And, I, and I'm, I'm more familiar with God's light. I know what to do when it's shown in on my heart, in on my life. And so I should become stronger in all of that as I grow, as I become stronger in the Lord. And so we, we're going to try to tackle a little bit more of this and I think, as, as you'd mentioned to me just a few moments ago, the best way to do that is first, what's a sin? Yeah, we've mentioned before what I like to do when when we're discussing a particular topic or subject is define the terms. We need to make sure we're talking about the same thing. And so, of course, the New Testament was originally written in Greek, and the word that is translated sin, hamartia, means a failing to hit the mark. And so, one way I illustrate that is that God has placed a target for us, or he's set a standard, he's set the bar, and we all have completely missed that bar, that target. Romans 3.23 reminds us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So, we've fired our arrow at that target, and it didn't even get there. It fell short. And it made me think of the example, I, I do quite a bit of target shooting, and uh, I was sighting in a new red dot on my rifle some time ago. So I sent the target out about, you know, 75 feet, whatever, and fired three shots, you know, zeroed right in on the bullseye, fired three shots to see where the group was and brought the target back in and there were no holes in the target. I had completely missed the mark. And so what I had to do was bring the target in real close and fire and see where where those bullets were going and they were way off so that told me okay i'm here's how i'm missing the mark this is what's happening so i need to make the adjustments that are necessary to bring my sights in line with the target so when i sent the target back out there after making the adjustments i was hitting the bullseye yeah but that's because I recognized I had missed the standard. I needed to reset, and once I did, everything was good. In addition to that, 1 John gives us a description of sin. John says that whoever commits sin, in 1 John chapter 3 at verse 4, commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. So, that tells us that if we're acting outside of the law of God, that's lawlessness. There's the, the Greek word there means no law. Then we're we're spiritual outlaws. We have we have now rebelled against God because we're now defining where sin is. We're setting the mark for ourselves. And if that mark is not in alignment with God, just like when I was sighting in, I'm gonna miss the target. And so we when we do that, we become a law unto ourselves. That, that's the danger, mm-hmm. which then is rebellion. I'm setting up my own law, Lord, not yours. I might mix a little of yours in or, or whatever, but there's just no room for that. We need 
to be focusing on hitting the mark. And so it, I think it's just important if we can look at sin that way, that God has set a standard and any deviation from that standard is sin and that's not going to be acceptable to him. Therefore, I need to look to his word, I need to pray, I need to seek the help of others that I can trust in spiritual matters to get sighted back in on that so I can line up and hit the target mm-hmm. that God wants me to. And Paul calls that the, uh, the high calling of Jesus Christ. It, it is a high calling. There's there's none higher, as a matter of fact. And I, I love the sighting in idea. There's there's several things spiritually that, that absolutely apply. One is the target is the standard. That that's You're trying to hit that. And the target's not going to move. It's not going to help you. It won't make adjustments. It won't justify why your shot is off. It'll just tell you the truth. And so, as you said, you bring it in closer. You say, oh, man, I'm way off, so let me get, let me find out how far off. And then as you stay, uh, continue to trust that standard, you realized at a shorter distance where you were off, what direction it was headed and, and moving to. So now you can start to make the adjustment. Right. Be, and it's not based on what you think or what you hope was going to be okay. It, the standard doesn't change. And, and we trust that because, uh, you know, if, for a hunter, when you get out into the field, you need to be sure at that point that it is true and, and that when you are looking down that site that you're on target. Because if you don't, you are wasting your time as a hunter. Right. So, so that there's a reason for it. We want to be good at this and those kind of things. And so there's, there's just a lot of great spiritual truths that start to seep out of that example you gave. I think that's really neat. Yeah, and that just shows I can't sight it in and you know I fire a shot and, oh, I'm down here a little over the left, but I, I, I nicked the black area of the targets. So that's good enough. And I do. I, I use my rifle to go hunt hogs. So I don't want to fire and completely miss or maybe just wound the hog uh, so that it runs off and I can't find it and it's off suffering somewhere. Right. I, I want to hit where I need to hit to humanely uh, get rid of that hog. So I need to make sure I am sighted dead on. Close isn't good enough. Right. I don't want to be close. I want to be on the standard. Yeah, the, the mark that God has set. Absolutely, that's that's a great example. So when when I'm again working through this in the last several days and thinking about God's light and what His light does for us, that I've thought about just in my own, like I said, in my own thought process, I've thought about different scenarios where this continues to open up for me, and, and I see it again and again and again. And so I want to give you an example of that, the power of God's light and, and how it how it impacts my daily life. If you were to take Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, because it, it fits in, in the conversation that we're having now, Hebrews 4, 12 through 13 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account." That is a powerful, powerful yeah. verse concerning God's word and the reality of our standing before him and that we will give an account. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account, which means nothing, nothing is hidden. First John chapter 1 and verse 5 tells us that God is light. And so just imagine yourself in any scenario or situation wondering about, you know, should I do this? that God, this ever-present light who shines on everything, will expose that. And not 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 to hurt us, it is for our benefit mm-hmm. so that we can see it. He provides it because he loves us and he wants us to, to meet that standard. And, and, and obviously, we're all in on that as well. So knowing that God's word pierces down to the division of soul and spirit and it discerns the thoughts and the intentions of my heart, this tells me, and I just want to give this to you as an example, but this tells me that I can I can be doing what we would call a godly work without doing God's will. I, I'm doing something that God absolutely says, yes, you should be doing this, but because I'm complaining or grumbling in my heart about that, that, that that's not within his will. And so see his light. The Pharisee would say, "No, I've done everything. I've done it all. You know, I've, I've I've kept the law perfectly. You 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 can watch me. You can follow me around." 
the problem with the fair, the heart of the Pharisee is that he, you know, again, with covetousness, which no one can see, he still has an issue within his heart that he's not settled yet, and so the rest is not gonna it's not gonna work out the way God expects or approves of, and that scares me to death. I've done a lot of good things in my life, I think, with the wrong agenda, seeking the wrong end. And so his light shows me that you better fix the condition of your heart. Yeah, I, I was just thinking of that when you were talking about the Pharisee. You know, Jesus commented on that. You tithe mint and anise and cumin. You know, so you're real careful about the little things. I, I do that all the time. But you have forgotten the weightier matters of the law. These things you ought to have done and not left the other undone. So, yeah, they were punctiliously following the law, but it was not with the right attitude, and Jesus rebuked that. Sometimes I, I, I like to do, or I'll, I'll mention to people that are struggling, to just step back a moment and think, would I do or say this thing if Jesus was standing here? Because he is. Right. And that's what we lose sight of when we start letting something turn us away. That I'm, I'm, I've made some great strides in this area. I've really, Jesus has given me the victory over a lot of this stuff. But every now and then I, I do this, you know, that it's not a big deal. Well, we're losing sight. We're losing our spiritual awareness, really. Mm-hmm. And that's a dangerous thing because we should remember, like we just read in, in Hebrews 4, Jesus is there and he sees what's going on. Yeah. He he's aware. So if we can honestly ask that question and say, and eh, no, if I do or say this, Jesus would not approve. Well, there's our answer. And then we can turn to him for strength. You know, Lord, I realize you don't approve of this. So please give me the strength and the help to overcome this and put it away and so that you can be glorified in the victory. But it's just it's just that spiritual awareness, and you know we're we're so constantly pressured by the world that sometimes we can start to lose some of that spiritual awareness. Oh yeah, yeah, all the time, and I, I like that too because I I have literally I've used my own visual um, when I'm driving, for example. So I come I come to work by myself, and so the truck seat. And the, the passenger seat is empty always, and so I look over there and I, you know, just visualize that he's with me. Jesus mm. is seated with me, and that has helped me tremendously because, mm. you know, just saying I, I know that you're with me, and 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 kind of just again, this is just you know, a mental thing for me, but I kind of put him in that seat, and and how many times has he looked at me and just said, "Hey, we're gonna make it. Why don't you calm down? You know, we're <laughs> gonna we're gonna get there." Because it's like you said, Jesus is not going to allow that. Every time I yell at somebody on the highway and have some you know wise remark to make, if Jesus is with me, He says, "You you do realize I died for that person." You know Ooh, what in yeah. the world? Now now I'm upset because of a traffic situation. Come mm. on, how pathetic, how petty. So it, it is helpful, and I, I use every tool I can because I'm trying to do better. I want to do better, and I don't want to repeat the same problem that I know God wants me to, to settle down and deal with. So I, I like that a lot. He, he is with us, you know, he's not in my passenger seat, but he's there and he yeah. knows all things. Everything is naked and exposed. Yeah. He's, he, of course we understand Jesus is on his throne in heaven. That's mm-hmm. where the person of Jesus is. But the fact that he is aware of everything means his presence is with me. You know, someone else might not know where I am or what I'm doing, but Jesus does every minute. That's right. So in that sense, he's there. His presence is with me because nothing is hidden from the eyes of him to whom we have to give an account. Yeah, that's exactly right. So let me give you an example. I'm, I'm signed up for um, elementary school Bible class, and uh, so I'm going to do a good thing. So I'm, 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 I'm getting in there. I'm ready to go. I'm, I'm fired up. I know what I'm going to teach them. They're all going to learn. It's going to be amazing. And uh, we get about two or three weeks in, and I'm way in over my head. I'm not doing well. Uh, I'm starting to be frustrated, maybe by the class. And so, again, my heart's starting to turn. I went in initially to serve God, to be a blessing to those children. And now my personal feelings, the last two weeks, whatever it may be, I begin to complain and grumble. 
and I can't wait when this quarter's over. So then the quarter comes to an end for us, and then you know our deacon Anthony comes up and he says, "Hey, I I need you to cover the class again. We got no one." Where am I then? You know, because I'm I'm looking towards the end of that quarter to end and say, "I'm almost finished. I'm I'm going to get out of here." Mm-hmm. So we can find ourselves saying, "I teach it. No one else teaches class. I'm the only one." And we threw everything out the window in that scenario that was good and godly because the earthly circumstances, whatever didn't go our way that we thought would go, or who knows what our problem might be. But I'm going to, I'm going to tell our deacon, yeah, I'll do it again while rolling my eyes and then complaining Mm -hmm. to my wife. Yeah. And have I done a godly work? No. Yeah. No. And I've, I've dealt with that. You know, probably both of us have, we teach a lot of classes Sometimes I'm teaching a class that just doesn't really appeal to me. I'm not into that subject, whatever it might be. And it's real, re- real easy to say, well, I'll just throw some notes together and, you know, that'll be good enough. No, I need to prepare for that class just as I would for one that I'm really excited about. Yeah, exactly. Fired up about. Mm-hmm. Because we're studying the Word of God. And like you say, if I, if I get negative about it, you know, it's it's just like ancient Israel. They were offering the sacrifices, but they were complaining. They were grumbling about it. We said, this is a weariness. And God just said, okay, just don't even offer it. I'm not going to accept it anyway. So just the fact of them putting a lamb on the altar was not enough. That attitude of worship and gratitude and confession and recognizing who we are has to be there too. Otherwise, it's it's empty worship. Yeah, but he, he gave them bread from heaven every day mm, because they were starving. Right. And, and they brought them in the wilderness to test them and for them to understand that they are fully reliant on him. And instead, they became disheartened, discouraged. They said, we, we despise this yeah. loathsome bread. It was the bread that had kept them alive. And because it was one flavor, same flavor every day, they said, we can't stand this anymore. We want to go back to Egypt and be whipped by our taskmasters. Imagine the frustration God is giving them bread that sustained their physical frames. And Paul makes that point in 1 Corinthians 10. Do not behave the way that they did. When God provided for them, they were his children. He brought them out. He redeemed them and saved them in, in, in that sense. And they, they grumbled about everything under the sun. And so here I am teaching Bible class, and I'm just another Israelite in the day of Moses. <laughs> yeah. No matter how proud I am of, of who I am or what I've done, there, there's, there's that carnal nature within us. Galatians 5 talks about the fact that spirit lusts against the flesh, and the flesh lusts against the spirit. Mm-hmm. And so they are directly opposed to each other, and they are fighting for your time and ultimately your soul. Yeah, and that's... that inner battle is always going on because Satan is not giving up trying to find a weak spot and use that to pry in and start pulling us away. So there's that, you know, that's the appeal of the flesh. That's what Satan's going to appeal to. But Jesus tells us the spirit lives within us. So he is trying to direct us through his word to, no, don't do that. Right. So here's this conflict. And we are given the choice, which way am I going to go with this? Uh, and James talks about that. He, he says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Grow closer to God and he will turn to you. He, right. He'll be there for you. So we can resist. It's just sometimes Satan comes at us in a weak moment. And we're just going to go, oh, it wouldn't be so bad if I do this just this time. It's no big deal. You know, it's not going to affect me a whole lot. Well, it might not affect you a whole lot, but it will affect you. Yeah. And it will affect you negatively. And the next time he comes with it, it'll be a little more. Mm -hmm. And you'll say, well, it wasn't so bad last time. Nothing happened. I can do it again. And pretty soon you're starting to slide down that cliff. Yeah. And the the light you once had is is growing more and more dim. Right. It's, it's, It's more difficult to see. What is the big deal? Why do you keep jumping on my back about this? And so that for me, and, and as we looked into this, that you know the title is "Little Sins." That if it's sin, as you pointed out, if you're missing the mark, then you are just missing the mark, and it can be corrected. 
God has given us his word, that light that shines on those things. And so they're exposed for what they are. And then we really do truly, personally, I don't need to go to somebody. I don't need a counselor. I need the word of God living and abiding in my heart and my life to to say, this is clearly wrong. And it doesn't take much effort at all these days with online searches and different things using scriptural tools. Logos is one of them, mm. uh, Bible oh, Hub. Yeah, yeah. There, there, there's several places you can go and just search word and terms and ideas. Yeah. Bible Gateway is another one. Bible Gateway, it yeah. It, yep. It'll just open this door and show you verse after verse after verse. Mm-hmm. Bible Topics, A to Z is another one online that you can search. And I'm just, everything under the sun is listed there. And so you can look at these passages I'm just saying that there's, there's, this is the quickest we've ever been able to get to what God's word says about A, B, and C. Mm. And I, I think that may have injured us a little bit because the diligent study is less, um, we're less fond of that because it's so easily retrieved. Mm. Good point. But the word is still the word and it applies perfectly mm-hmm. to our lives. And so once you see that, again, it takes courage to say, okay, Lord, shine light on this because I'm not sure if I should be doing this. When he shines that light on that, not just to know whether it's right or wrong, but to be prepared to move in a direction that he says is right. It takes courage. But in that, it goes back to what I've been saying repeatedly, which is we're growing. I mean, if, if you want a sign of personal growth, spiritual growth, it is, I looked into this, I found the truth in the word of God, and I changed the way I behave. Man, I'm telling you, you you're moving you're on the right track. God is with you, as you said. You have resisted the devil. You've gone to the one counselor of all, the true counselor. You have seen fit to to let him tell you what is right with with the full intention of doing it. In in Jeremiah, I think it's 49, chapter 49, the, the people say to Jeremiah, pray to the Lord <laughs> and ask him if we should go to Egypt or not. Yeah. And they And they say to him, whether we like it or we don't like it, we'll do whatever the Lord says. And so Jeremiah says, I will go and pray to the Lord. Ten days pass. He comes back and he says, thus says the Lord, you shall not go back to Egypt. And they said, we're going to Egypt. Yeah. That's not the word of the Lord. <laughs> yeah, you're lying. Yeah. And, so, and, then, and Jeremiah That's tells amazing. them point blank, you were hypocrites the day you asked me. And he repeats to them, you told me whether you liked what you heard or didn't like, you would do what God told you to do. And here you stand today, 10 days later, saying, I've heard the word of the Lord and I ain't doing it. Yeah, I don't like that. So we've got to be careful. Sometimes we say, okay, tell me what the word of the Lord is. I'll do whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're not. Well, I didn't think it would go that far. (laughs) Because we think, we're convinced he'll say, yeah, go to Egypt. So it's like, oh, cool, we agree. Let's just go to Egypt. No, <laughs> no, you don't agree. God is right. You are wrong. And so they go to Egypt anyway, and he says, you're going to be destroyed by the sword and by yep. famine and by pestilence. And they all were. They, it happened, yep. Just so like God, God is, God is again, it's not for him to get over on us or to tell us he told us so. It's for our good. He loves us. And so the light is shown so you can see where you're going. He's got that standard out there, as we said at the top of the show. And he wants you to hit that standard. Uh, there's a great passage in Peter where he, he tells us that God has revealed all this. He wants us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the, G- of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter tells us why. He says, so that you may become partakers of the divine nature. Yeah. God wants us to be like him. That's why he has set that mark there. You shall be holy because I'm holy. You'll do it this way because I am holy. Well, right. what does that mean? It means that God is set apart. He is outside and above and beyond sin. It has no place with him. As, as you mentioned from John, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So there can be no darkness to reside there. And what he's calling on the people to to do, what he's reminding them of in Leviticus is, I am a holy God. There is no room for sin with me. And and so Peter applies that that principle um, in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. He says, be holy in all your conduct. Why, he says, because God said, I am holy. So if you're going to walk with me, 
you need to do what I say. Do what I tell you to do the way I tell you to do it. You must be holy in all your conduct. Yeah. So there's there's no exceptions there. There's no little, I can't keep a pocket in my life and say, I'm, there's a little bit of sin in here. That that can't be a problem. You know, it, it's, a, it's a little thing. Well, Paul told the Corinthians, purge out the leaven. Because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. That's right. Don't be deceived. Yeah. It is so, always the case. Uh, the whole we we need, I think, and that's one reason to read Leviticus. We need to appreciate the holiness of God. He's not us. He's he's he is above sin, and he wants us to be that way too, because he wants us to be like him. And so that's why he does all these things. That's why he gives us these warnings and makes these firm statements. You know, they're they're pretty brusque. Uh, leave you know, leave no room. Make no provision for the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather even reprove them. So he doesn't want us to indulge in sin because that's going to make us less than what he wants us to be. And I think if we can meditate on that and gain an appreciation of that and realize God's going to be there to help me do that, when I go to him and say, yes, Lord, like you're saying, Danny, your light has exposed this. I need to get this out of my life, and I need your help. Yeah, well, God will provide that help. He will. Uh, Paul says to work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. So it's going to take work. It's work that we, it's an ongoing work for us. But the Lord's standing right there helping us with the work. Mm-hmm. He's working in our lives too. So it's, it's, not, it's not that we're all alone in it. He's there to carry us through. That's right. In the Old Testament, the question is asked, can two walk together unless they're both agreed? Mm-hmm. The answer is no. And if we're going to walk with the Lord, then we've, we've got to be in agreement with him. And again, with as that light shines, the powerful light of God shines, it will continue to reveal, and it'll always be for our good, and, and it has to be seen that way because of his great love. And I think what, another thing that had kind of been moving through my mind was that we're talking about those who are studying, they, they love the Word, they love what they found and learned, mm. they're growing in that. The, 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 the warning from Jesus is so strong about those who begin to walk with him. He does not want you to give up. He doesn't want you to be distracted. Again, he wants you to abound. He wants you to move forward and to grow and get stronger every single day and and, and, and to know why you're getting stronger and how that's done. And that as you, as you just said so well, because God is with me, I, it, I know what's in me. I can't do this on my own, but God has placed his word in my, in my heart and in my life. And so I can begin to move forward and I can walk with him and that he allows that. Yeah, I, I it blows my mind that that an all knowing, powerful, holy, righteous God would have any interest in all at all in in a in a fallen being that has failed him so horribly that yet his love is still pouring out toward us and and, and given to us and shown to us. It, it just has to be because the reward on the other side to do it right and to be with him and to see it through to the end is such an, a magnificent and brilliant reward that never stops giving to us and to him that it's yeah. worth it for him to, to stick with it. And that, that really is a very interesting idea. It, if it's worth it to him, then it has to be worth it to me. Yeah. And Paul reminded the Corinthians of that. He said that the glories that await us can't compare Try with what we have now. Romans there, 8. It's, yep. just, it's just no way that we can look at what we have now and say, hey, this is good enough. This is not bad. What ha- God has in store for us is beyond our imagination. Mm-hmm. But he keeps on reminding us it's so much better that it's worth it. It's worth me giving my son yeah. for you to be able to, to have that opportunity. Yeah. So it's worth it for you to imitate my son. This life is the stage and the testing ground for, for the decisions we're going to make about righteousness, holiness, and sin. And, the, and there's two options. There's two great powers that are set before us that we are aware of. One is God, and he is 
eternally, ultimately great beyond all things. The other great power that exists and is allowed to exist is the devil and the work that he will do and wants to see done in us. And so we're we're in submission to one or the other. Paul says in Romans 6, you are either a slave to, to sin and to disobedience or you're a slave unto righteousness. And so I am proud to be a slave of righteousness and I, I will follow and obey God because as we've been pointing out, the end result of all of this is guaranteed. It's immovable. It can't be shaken. It's provided by Almighty God. It's worth every bit of my being to see it through to the end, and that is the role that I would that I would need to play. In Luke nine and verse sixty one, Jesus says to us, "Anyone who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God." A very brief statement, but very powerful. We yeah. look to Jesus and say, "Boy, I like several of the things you got going on over there, Lord." I can see the benefit of being a part of that. And he says, if you if you think this is one foot in one camp and one foot in the other, you are sorely mistaken. So we want to encourage everyone who's hearing this today that don't be disheartened or discouraged about some challenge that you'll come up against. It, it, it's another place that you just want to shine that light on, work through that in a godly way, and come out purified ultimately, tested, tried by fire if necessary, and then purified in that process, that you're stronger for that. The, the one who turns back, the one who looks back to the, the temporal elements of the world has traded their soul ultimately. Yeah, and, and Jesus said, what, what value is it if a person gains the whole world but loses his soul? Hmm. Your soul is much more valuable this, than this entire world. And, and Satan will tempt us like he tempted Jesus. If if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. Hmm. Well, he does the same thing for us. Here's all, I'll, I'll let you have, I'll offer you women or, you know, drinking whatever, whatever the situation might be. Just listen to me, mm-hmm. follow me. And I'll, I'll do these things for you. Well, that's, the book of Proverbs uh, uses that picture. There's the wisdom is portrayed as a woman who stands out and calls on people to come to her and learn. But then there's the adulterous woman, the one who is enticing to sin. She stands on the street corner and says with a loud voice, I was waiting for you. That's right. Yeah, or anyone else that came along. <laughs> I was waiting for just you. Come on, let's let's get together. It's going to be fun. My husband's not at home. It's all good. So there's that constant in time. It's it's the world, and it's Jesus. They're both laying it out before us, and like we mentioned in James, he tells us, "Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. He'll be there to help you against that." And just like Jesus said it, he quoted scripture, and Satan gave up for that time. Yeah, he said he he left for a more convenient time. So yeah, Satan didn't give up, but Jesus was victorious because he stood on the word of God. That's right. And I'll offer one more thing. I think it's very wise in this day and age to surround yourself with like-minded people. Yes, you get yourself surrounded by those who also love the Lord. You will help and assist each other. One is stronger in a, in a situation that that another is not, and so we. We speak to each other. We encourage each other. We push each other towards that goal and that mark in love always. But if you surround yourself with godly people who just won't allow that, don't ever see that as a bad thing. That's a good thing. You have you have people who say, hey, the Bible says this. We need more of that. We need to know that that's being said in love and there's strength there. If I wander off into the dark areas of this life, in the dark street corners of the city I live in, I'll find somebody who knows nothing about the Word of God, and it is all about whatever we want to do, and that's going to injure me spiritually. I don't need help thinking of sinful things to do. I need help being more spiritually minded. So I would just encourage everyone here, if you're with godly people, that is fantastic. Keep doing that. Spend your time. Invite folks over. Have meals, conversations. If you're going to go to a ball game or whatever else may be available to you that is wholesome and healthy, Bring those that you love and who love the Lord with you and continue to build those relationships because those are 
they will last a lifetime. They are built truly on love and not on self-service, and it, it will help you in, in some of the darker moments of your life. And all of us need it. There are no exceptions to that. Jesus says to us in Luke 14, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Which one of you intending to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost? He's asking us, you need to see this through. What does it mean to follow Jesus? It means picking up a cross, apparently, and following him. And and with the one who never committed sin being treated so horribly by his fellow man, that that's going to be part of this as well. Someone's going to make fun of you because you no longer run in that flood of dissipation with them. Mm -hmm. Because you're the light. You're shining light on what they're doing. They hate it. So that's probably a good sign. Yep. Men love, sin loves darkness uh, because then it gets to do what it wants. And it doesn't like to have the light shined on it. People don't like to be shown that what you're doing is wrong. It's deadly. It's evil. Yeah. Hey, it's my thing. You can't tell me what's right or wrong. I've already decided. Yeah. Leave me alone. (laughs) No. Yeah, we don't want to do that. There are eternal consequences in that decision. That's right. There absolutely are. So we hope this has been encouraging to all of you. We do have trivia questions for each other. And, do. and that means, because Kurt and I ask each other two trivia questions, that's four for all of you who are listening. We hope that you're uh, thinking about scriptural things and that you're able to answer these trivia questions that we give to you now. Um, let me let me give you the first one. Okay. And I I'm just a wanna, glutton for punishment. Good, because I, I just want to <laughs> say, I, I feel like this is like a level, one more difficult level than what we normally, where we normally float around. So Uh-oh. maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I think. Here's question number one. Trivia. Sweet trivia. Hebrews 11. Great Hall of Faith. Mm -hmm. You with me? Mm -hmm. Name three men and two women that are found in Hebrews 11. Rahab and Deborah are the women. That's two women. Moses, Noah, and uh, David. Well, no, no, not... Well, David, yeah, he's in there. Yes, he is in there. Yeah. He is in there. Okay. Uh, and then there's also Barak, who was with Deborah as her general. And Samson. All right, no and, showing off. Uh, just, well, I just, I just <laughs> want to make sure the bases are covered here. Yeah, that's a marvelous chapter. Just the great demonstrations of faith, that they did what God said to do, and that is a faith... That works unto salvation. All right, you gave me Deborah. Deborah is not in there. What, what were the two women? Did you name another woman? Rahab. Yeah, is one, and Deborah's not in there. <laughs> um, you know well, this. I can't, I can't think of it. Right you know now. this. I don't want to keep on using up time, but I, yeah, it doesn't come to mind. Oh, I'll give you the name of her husband, Abraham. Oh, Sarah. Okay. Yes, Sarah. You, you did great. You would think Deborah would be in there because Bayrak's mentioned, and he didn't That's do probably, much. Yeah, <laughs> Bayrak was kind of the wimp, really. <laughs> I'll go if you go. <laughs> well, okay, I'll go, but then the glory's not going to go to you. It's <laughs> going to go to a woman. Yes, so we'll give you give me gra- a half a grace points or something. Yeah, I don't know. A What's participation my, what, trophy. What is my first question? Okay, well, I'm not going to... Take vengeance because that's that's not my place. Right, it belongs to God. Yep. So Moses was uh, the one who led Israel out of Egypt and through the wilderness up to the border of Canaan, and then he died. Who came after Moses as the new leader of Israel? Joshua, Moses' assistant. Yes, Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Uh, Joshua succeeded Moses. Moses appointed him. He was, he mentored him. He was his assistant for all the way through the wilderness. Uh, And then so God appeared to Joshua and told him, be strong and of of good courage and I will not forsake you. That's right. Awesome. All right. Question three for everyone. Question two for Kurt. Give us five, (laughs) give us five of the qualifications that the Holy Spirit gives for us, as we appoint elders, just give me five qualifications that are in that. 
Has to be the husband of one wife. Has one. to have children that believe. Yeah. Not given to much wine. Not given uh, to money. Filthy lucre, the old King James says. Mm -hmm. uh, he cannot be a novice in the faith. And that's five. That is five. And there's a several more. Mm -hmm. Very good. That's found in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. Correct. The qualifications of an elder. That's right. Good job. All right. And so here's our final one. The second for Danny and the fourth for our listeners. What is notable about Elizabeth in the New Testament? Why is she portrayed? Elizabeth? Yeah. Little hint. Luke talks about her. Oh, What's man. What's important about Elizabeth? Man, I was not even... I didn't have her in my head. She is going to be the mother of John the Baptist. That's right. Yep. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. She had been barren, but... God is going to correct that, and she's going to give birth to the one who will prepare the way for the Lord. Awesome. Very That's good. really, really good. So as we finish today, <clears throat> there's a couple of things that we'd like to, to share as well, because just for the recording, we want to give these passages to you, and we would encourage you to look them up. There are several places in the Word of God where you, it really is better, I think, better than us reading them and saying, this is what it means. I think it's better for the individual who's saying, what does the Lord want to see in my life? To, to just sit alone by yourself, read these passages, and then, and then rightly apply those passages. Hebrews 10, 26 through 31 is, is a mm. great section of passage to read through. Um, and every one of those verses there kind of ties to this idea of someone who would begin to drift away or, or maybe to dabble in what would even be a little sin. Another one is 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20 through 22 speaks directly to the topic we were addressing today. An individual who has tasted the good gift of God, they have begun to walk in and with the Lord and for some reason have turned away. Peter deals with that, and the language is very, very strong. And so I'll read one for you as we close, and this will be our final thing for today. But Romans 13, in verse 11, the Apostle Paul encouraging the Christians in Rome, he says, and do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. 